Hello everyone, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, special session uh, from NPTEL. Um, we will look at uh, metallurgical and materials engineering uh, this evening. Um, primarily this is uh, intended at an audience uh, which is uh, maybe considering uh, college studies in metallurgical and materials engineering uh, and maybe you are curious as to what this department is about, uh, what you will learn in it, um, maybe why you have not heard about it much before and uh, one second yeah so uh, uh, what you've heard about it and uh, why you haven't heard much about it and uh, what is the uh, what are the future options in it so uh, we will uh, uh, begin this session i will move to some slides i will uh, show you a lot of slides uh, as we go along and in the end we will uh, look at some questions i think already there is a link where you can uh, post your questions uh, i see that there are already some questions uh, in place um, and towards the end we will start answering those questions um, yes so let's begin with uh, asking ourselves this question uh, um, maybe many of you haven't heard about it before uh, metallurgical and materials engineering and i think that's uh, uh, I, maybe that's been changing over the years but it is true that in i think uh, much of uh, high school, we do not formally hear much about uh, <coughs> uh, metallurgical and materials engineering. Uh, we hear you know friends getting into mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, uh, computer science, electrical and so on. And what you will see now uh, will surprise you that uh, you know somehow how is it that you ended up uh, uh, missing out on hearing about metallurgical and materials engineering. So we will start uh, with a few slides and then we will uh, uh, proceed. Excuse me. So, uh, metallurgical and materials engineering uh, is uh, a field of uh, study uh, which has actually been around for a very long time. Uh, and uh, what is most surprising uh, from the context of, uh, excuse me. Yeah, so what is uh, surprising about this uh, whole uh, uh, area of study uh, is that uh, it is uh, very prevalent and it is there in almost all aspects of life that we are uh, uh, currently used to and surprisingly we have not uh, known about it. So if you take commonplace items uh, and that is where I think uh, if you start looking at what is around you, you will understand that uh, this uh, area of study is uh, uh, you know, uh, very commonplace even though you do not hear about it in school. You take commonplace items, morning you get up and at your home they give you I do not know a bone meta or coffee or whatever they give you that is in a tumbler. Typically in Indian conditions that is a stainless steel tumbler. That has come from a metallurgical process. The plate you, uh, you eat in uh, that is a metallurgical product. The uh, uh, stove that you use at your home, the, uh, the gas cylinder that is there uh, is a metallurgical product. The vehicle you travel in to your school. It could be your school bus, it could be your car, it could be your two wheeler. Almost everything in that is a metallurgical product. You have the engine, uh, there is a casting there, uh, there is a solid casting there, uh, that is a metallurgical uh, product. Uh, you have the uh, uh, you know body of the vehicle, all those sheets that are around uh, that vehicle, uh, the doors that you open to get in or, you s uh, or the general structure on which you sit, all of that is a metallurgical product. Uh, and then, uh, and then, and it goes on. I mean, uh, almost everything that we use, both commonplace items as well as extremely uh, high-end modern items. Uh, I spoke about the bus that you go to school in, uh, or to go to college in. Uh, consider the trains that you travel in. Uh, not just the body of the train, the track you uh, that is that uh, the train is traveling on. That track is a metallurgical product. It is coming off of some steel industry and that is where it is uh, uh, obtained from. So wherever you travel in India, you are sitting in a vehicle that is a metallurgical product 
you are traveling on a track uh, that is a metallurgical product you eat on a utensil that's a metallurgical product so that is the extent to which it is prevalent uh, we take great pride in the rockets that go uh, from india to the space uh, try to land on the moon a lot of different things uh, uh, that we accomplish all those products are metallurgical products uh, the aeroplanes that fly many parts of those structures are metallurgical products so uh, that is the range of metallurgical products uh, and a broader uh, stream of products uh, are there once you start talking about materials engineering. So, because material uh, includes all sorts of materials including metals. Metallurgical engineering tends to focus on metal related products. Materials engineering is even more widespread. And so, uh, the most commonplace device that you use today is your mobile phone. Uh, the mobile phone has multiple parts which are all based on materials. And the core of the mobile phone, the chip that is used, the core of your uh, computer, the laptop that you use or the desktop that you use, the primary central part of that computer is a materials engineering product. And when you say that, you know, your uh, computer uh, went from you know, one generation to the other and say two years from now you are suddenly using uh, or this or today, let's say you are using a computer that is 10 times faster than the computer that was used last year a very significant uh, part of that improvement of a factor of 10 in the speed or the ability of the computer is related to materials. Uh, there is a material scientist who has worked on that part and made it capable of uh, operating at that higher speed. So almost anything you touch on a day to day basis has been touched by a metallurgist. That is the significance of this field. Uh, and it could be anything, like I said, you know, even a doctor conducting a surgery is uh, using parts that are made by metallurgists. So, uh, it is indeed very amazing that you have this field that is so widely prevalent uh, in terms of the products that we use and we touch and we handle uh, from both commonplace products to very high end products uh, and yet it is not something that we often hear about. But that is the strange part of how things are uh, in the world. So, almost any company you, uh, you go to uh, will have a metallurgist or a material scientist. So, what are these people doing? So, metallurgical and materials engineering uh, is about the study and improvement and development of metals as well as different types of materials. Broadly, they do uh, these two things. Uh, metallurgical and materials engineers often make many of the things that we use. And I already gave you a wide range of examples, but anything, even your tennis racket, your uh, you know shuttle racket, lot of different things are made by met metallurgical and materials engineers. Then other thing that they do is, uh, they make many of the things that we already use even better. So previously you use certain uh, types of things, and now they are you know next generation is way better than the previous generation of uh, uh, product, and a very important aspect of that improvement is from a metallurgical or a materials engineer. And again, that uh, covers everything. I mean, your sports, uh, let's say bicycles, these sports cycles, these kinds of cycles that the, uh, you know, high speed uh, cyclists use, uh, they have uh, improved dramatically over the years. And primarily that's because of the new kinds of uh, materials that have been used uh, to make them very light. So you have bicycles which you can, you know, very comfortably lift with just one, uh, one hand. A normal person uh, without any, you know, great strength can very uh, comfortably lift it in one hand because that cycle is so light. This has happened primarily because of the composite materials that have been used to create that bicycle. If you look at, uh, uh, I, I just showed you and I shared with you the idea that this is a field that is uh, very prevalent in our life uh, and we just didn't notice it. It's one of those things that, you know, just because it is all around us, we are no longer noticing it. Uh, and that is the kind of uh, uh, you know situation this field uh, is in. It is also very interesting to note that historically also this field has been there for a very long time. Uh, I mean, we talk about various new areas of research and whatnot. They all come out very recently. But if you look back historically, in fact, our whole civilization, the whole human development, has been marked by the use of specific materials. And that is why you see something called the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and so on. And uh, so we defined our existence uh, based on the materials we used at uh, in specific eras. 
because that also uh, it is very important you have to understand why this is so important uh, this is very important because um, the materials we used in many ways defined what we could do or many ways defined the limits of what we could do and that is why this uh, uh, you know uh, that is why historically we have sp uh, split our history our understanding of human civilization uh, into these eras which are defined by the materials that dominated that era of uh, existence and so you had the stone age the bronze age and the iron age and in towards the end of this talk i will uh, discuss about nanomaterials but it seems like today we are now in the age of nanomaterials so that we will uh, look at later so you will also see you will wonder why all these materials were not available to us at the same time why is it that we had you know two and a half million years when there was only stone age and then there was bronze age and iron age Actually, interestingly, it has got to do with how well we have been able to control temperature, uh, how well we have been able to access high temperatures. So, the development of you know furnaces and ab ability to heat things to higher and higher temperatures is what defined this uh, these eras, and that is why, say, only from 1200 BC onwards, uh, we've had uh, the Iron Age uh, because only then we could reach temperatures uh, associated with it. So this is just uh, some background. So, uh, so we see two, two major points that this is a field that makes products uh, that all of us use, uh, I mean extensively in all phases of our life and that this is a field that has been around for, uh, I mean has not just been around, has defined our existence in many ways. So, uh, so these are two very interesting points to have in mind. So I will I will ask you a very rhetorical question and uh, we will uh, answer it later. Uh, have you eaten a metal? Is my question. Uh, you keep this in your mind. Uh, we will uh, talk about this uh, in towards the end of this talk. Um, so uh, uh, please understand the question carefully. I have not I am not asking you have you eaten on a metal. So when you take a plate and you put food on it and you eat, you are eating using a metal. You may be using a spoon. You may be using a fork. You may be using your hands. Maybe the plate is made of a metal, stainless steel plate, whatever. That is not what my question is. I am not also asking you, you know, in the in the food uh, that you ate, did it have iron minerals, did it have some sodium mineral, whatever. That is not again the question that I am asking you. It is not the minerals. That, have you eaten a metal? Like, you know, you have taken a piece of metal and eaten it. Is, is that, uh, that is the question that I want to ask you. Um, just because, you know, uh, again, it, it goes to show how we take things for granted. And we don't notice things that are uh, that faces uh, that uh, you know scare us on the, uh, on the face. So you just keep this in your mind. We will get back to this uh, as we go along. Okay, so I have put a abbreviation on top: MME, Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. And uh, so just keep uh, uh, bear with me on that MME. Um, well, they say Mechanical Engineering is ME, and uh, Chemical Engineering is CH. So this is MME, Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. So what do we do? here in metallurgical and materials engineering or in any institute that works on metallurgical and materials engineering. Wide range of things here, I have just listed a bunch of them uh, in you know balloons that are around the central uh, MME. So I will just read out the names and then we will, uh, we will get on to uh, describing what they are. So you have materials joining, uh, there is no particular order here, I mean it is just there in a circle so do not worry too much about the sequence in which I am uh, pointing it out. Uh, maybe I should actually start with iron and steel technology, um, then there is something called materials joining, uh, there is something called uh, uh, metal forming and mechanical behavior, uh, there is another thing called ICME, we will talk about that, something called surface engineering, material characterization, physical metallurgy, uh, materials engineering, uh, ceramics and biomedical applications, uh, materials uh, processing uh, and so on. So this is, you can see a wide range of uh, topics here. So, if you actually joined a metallurgical engineering department somewhere, metallurgical and materials engineering department somewhere, you are likely to see these uh, different aspects. I will also tell you historically, um, uh, let us say in the last 50 years or so, um, initially all these departments started off as metallurgical engineering departments and which means their focus was only on metallic systems. Okay? And why this focus on metallic systems? Well, you look at your periodic table. Uh, almost two thirds of the elements there are metals. So uh, again, it is something that is very prevalent. It is just there. I mean, we don't notice it, but it is right there. And many of the products that were being made, even in let's say in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, many of those products were all, uh, I mean, predominantly dominated by met metals. 
even today even today if you go and see the material that is used the most it is typically uh, metallic system typically based of iron typically based on steel so this is still the largest material that is being used uh, in terms of anything in terms of large structures that are being made uh, the automobiles that are being made the trains etc a lot of stuff is being made by metallic processes new materials have started coming which uh, which provide either alternatives to metals or they provide uh, some way in which you can uh, uh, combine it with the metal in some form and then uh, use it so that is why uh, over a period of time in the last uh, say 20 years or so a wide range of new materials people have started uh, finding and they have started incorporating into their technologies and products uh, and so many of the departments that uh, were there in many engineering colleges or universities both in india and abroad uh, started off as traditionally metallurgical engineering departments and ho have over the last uh, at least two 20 years or so last two decades have uh, shifted into metallurgical and materials engineering because realistically most of us are working in this combination and metal is a material i mean in, in a, even though it has been the predominant material and that uh, that got us first into that area it is still a material and it is uh, in from the family of materials available to us uh, and so we have shifted to that mode and uh, that is why many departments now are metallurgical and materials engineering so i think that's that's uh, important for you to keep that in mind uh, because that will give you some sense of uh, perspective on this so now these are various different topics i'm just going to go over a, a slice of these uh, uh, and give you some idea of what you may learn if you join uh, college in metallurgical and materials engineering also give you some idea of what your future might be if you continue in this field uh, i am a metallurgist by the way uh, i didn't really introduce myself to you um, my name is pratap haridas uh, I am a professor in the Department of uh, Metallurgical and Materials Engineering at IIT Madras. Uh, I studied Metallurgical Engineering uh, in my undergraduate at IIT Madras. Uh, I did a PhD in uh, Material Science and Engineering at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison in the US and, uh, and worked in different company and then a company before I joined here. So uh, my background is very much in this area. So uh, uh, that is the point I wish to make. Uh, and uh, it has done a lot of, uh, I've had the opportunity to work on many interesting things and I'm quite happy to uh, uh, encourage you to look at this field. So let's just look at some of the things that you might learn. There is something called metal forming and mechanical behavior. So uh, I, we spoke about, you know, a tumbler, we spoke about a plate, right? So these are all things that are coming, uh, they are not made directly in that shape, okay? So uh, generally, if you even if you if you had an opportunity to go to a car company and so on, uh, to see how they put cars together, so they will get uh, like a roll of steel. They will get a roll of a certain type of steel, or if it's if they have shifted to aluminum or any other metal, they'll get a roll of that metal. Okay, so they will. It will be just like a carpet roll or something like that. It will be a roll. So then they will take that roll and they will uh, they'll have machines for this. They have machines for this in which it will be unrolled and then they will uh, cut a piece out of it which has the you know, broad outline of what is desired and then they will press it, press it so that it takes that shape, it takes that contour that you want. So these days cars do not come with flat surfaces, they all have some curved surface, there is some feature that is sticking out this side, sticking out that side, that is how you get the shape of the car. It has some uh, interesting features to it uh, visually uh, plus for aerodynamic purposes uh, so both functional uh, uh, aspects as well as aesthetic aspects they do various things to the shape of the car um, and uh, for us as customers it makes a dif big difference there are cars that we look at and we say i mean how could they even have thought of making something like this it looks very bad but i know it is a matter of taste and so on but still it is there so shaping the metal is a very important aspect of uh, the metallurgical engineering process. So metal forming is basically that you form a metal into some shape. So that is what metal forming is. Mechanical behavior is the science behind it. You are trying to understand how you can do this forming and uh, what is the limit of it. So let us say I take a flat sheet of paper, uh, sheet of metal and I deform it a little bit to get a plate. Okay, so so what has happened by and large i have done some deformation at the edge edge of that plate and that is how i have got that lip for the plate supposing i take the same sheet of metal and convert it to a tumbler so now you suddenly see that uh, the tumbler is significantly deeper than the plate right so you have to take a flat sheet of metal and then slowly change its shape 
so that it doesn't first of all break it should not break it should not uh, cut off in some uh, arbitrary location etc it should neatly take the shape of the uh, tumbler without getting damaged so you see you already taken some two different uh, shapes from a sheet of metal you can make a deeper vessel out of it lot of different things you can do but to do this in a industrial scale uh, to do it repeatedly without damaging the metal metal uh, you need to know the science behind it and that is what mechanical behavior uh, behavior is all about and lot of tools are used for this lot of uh, 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 things like punch and die is used here and this whole process is called plastic deformation uh, and so on so this is all there and many items we use actually use this metal forming process so i mentioned at the start of this talk that we talk about uh, that you know when we travel anywhere in india uh, especially if you are on a train you are on railway tracks railway tracks are exactly formed like this i mean all the railway tracks you know uh, god knows uh, how many hundreds of thousands of kilometers of uh, railway track we have in india uh, because of our you know really nice uh, uh, extensive railway network that we have here uh, the tracks are all made using metal forming process hot metal is taken and then it is you know pushed into various shapes beaten into various shapes and then you find you get a railway track out um, during my college days i had the privilege and the pleasure of uh, visiting the bilai steel plant uh, and uh, there i saw this being done in fact they take great pride in saying at least at that time which was uh, uh, in the early 90s uh, they took great pride in telling uh, saying that anywhere in india if you are on a train then that you are you are uh, on a track that has been made by the bilai steel plant uh, they were the uh, uh, primary suppliers for the uh, tracks at that time uh, maybe others are supplying now but that was the thing and they were really proud of it uh, and it's really very nice to know anywhere you are you are on a train the track is from the bilai steel plant so uh, that's nice to know so this is metal forming and mechanical behavior and uh, we look at things like this how do things fail so you have plastic deformation you take and these are things that we actually uh, experience on a day to day life right how things fail you take a, a paper clip or a, or even a, you know some small uh, uh, you know the uh, lid of some tin and you can press it to push it this way that way that is all plastic deformation you can bend it to a point where it suddenly changes shape uh, that is plastic deformation uh, you can have instantaneous fracture uh, so normally when you bend a piece of tin it doesn't break right so or you uh, take a paper clip you bend it it doesn't break but you take a pencil you try break uh, bending it it will break okay so that is a uh, instantaneous fracture then you can also break certain things by what is called fatigue fatigue means you keep on moving up and down up and down up and down and eventually it will break we do that all the time so you try to break something you bend it one way it doesn't break you bend it the other way it doesn't break you continue to bend this way that way this way that way eventually it breaks what you have done is fatigue failure this is called fatigue failure then there is there are other things like environmentally assisted fracture uh, so where you put some uh, you know uh, liquid in that region uh, which is uh, corrosive which which means it starts attacking that material as you are bending it and then it breaks so lot of other things like including wear wear is again something that uh, um, we have in all the technologies that we use um, and we even use it uh, we say if something got worn out right we use that kind of a phrase that's basically what it is i mean when metal surfaces keep on rubbing each other uh, so for example you are on a cycle you are driving a cycle uh, you are using the handle bar your your wheels are rotating uh, so there are a lot of moving parts as long as there are moving parts uh, there those parts are rubbing against each other and when they are rubbing against each other they begin to wear of course sure you use ball bearing and this and that and what not so uh, you use uh, lubricants to reduce the wear and that is the science that is in fact exactly the science what kind of things you will do to reduce the wear because you want the product to last very long so all of these things uh, together constitute this mechanical behavior of materials then there is this aspect of materials joining okay so again let's start with something common place you have seen people welding you see people you know on the street side welding uh, various things uh, you see your uh, window grill being welded a lot of such stuff you see so our perception of welding is only that we think of this uh, very common place uh, welding uh, especially in indian conditions you see small shops here and there doing welding and we think that's all welding is uh, and so maybe we think it is a low end activity not at all i mean it, it, it is a low end activity also but that is again uh, one of those characteristics of the metallurgical and materials engineering uh, realm that you have many of these things which are very common place excuse me and we also have the same thing at a very high end level 
so you take uh, you know uh, uh, parts made for uh, uh, the rockets uh, many of them have to be uh, sealed tight you cannot have uh, you cannot bolt two things together because uh, the bolt has holes you have thread and the two materials are not stuck together so if you put some liquid inside it will start leaking everywhere so you need to do lot of welding lot of welding is there in uh, various uh, high end uh, you know vehicles and so on and that welding has to be of some very high quality you have to have a, a seal there which is uh, perfect air tight uh, pressure tight can handle a wide range of temperatures and so on so there is a very large field of study which is called materials joining where they are exactly looking at this they are looking at different materials how they come together and uh, when they come together under what conditions you you can make them join and uh, it, it usually related to heat uh, may have other uh, aspects associated with it you can introduce some new material there etc uh, you uh, but primarily this kind of a combination and you uh, put it together you also study in that case uh, what happens uh, to the uh, uh, microstructure so uh, that is again something that is uh, interesting uh, to look at so when you look at microstructure of welded parts what is microstructure you take this uh, two sheets that you uh, welded together and you put it below a microscope and you see uh, what has happened to the sheets on either side of the welding and at the welded location okay what are we looking for we are looking for some structure which represents uh, what has happened to the material we call that a face which basically is a region in that material over which properties are uniformly constant and uh, we want to see what has happened on either side of the material with respect to that uh, because usually when you heat a material and then you cool it down uh, these uh, structures in the material change uh, i will give you a very uh, simple thing you can associate with uh, if you go to a hardware store uh, you can look at sheets of metal that are there and you will see very evidently uh, shiny patches which are you know visually quite visible to you lot of uh, shiny patches uh, in that uh, me metal and those are actually grains uh, grains of whatever uh, um, material is there that means within that the atoms are in perfect order and then uh, the next grain has atoms in perfect order in a different direction and so on um, and you get to see uh, you can change the size of the grain you can change the composition of the grain um, etc by heating it cooling it and so on so if you start off saying that for my rocket i need a particular metal with a particular grain structure uh, and so on and then you do welding to it when times the welding will change the structure so that is why they do this kind of uh, study to understand uh, what has uh, happened so materials joining is a very uh, sophisticated area of study um, and a lot of a lot of scientists work very hard uh, to find out uh, new new ways to join materials or the ways to take the existing materials and join them such that their properties are uh, safeguarded then there is uh, iron and steel technology i mentioned that uh, iron and uh, steel uh, industry is very prevalent in all things that we uh, use uh, it is still uh, the largest material that is used in an industrial scale uh, you know tall buildings have uh, any building you have you know this uh, when they say reinforced concrete those reinforcement bars are all uh, based on some uh, iron and steel product uh, the tall buildings really tall buildings all have uh, steel structures inside them giving them uh, shape and strength um, you take ships you take uh, aircraft aircraft have moved away from uh, these they don't use iron and steel uh, i mean uh, they never did because it is too heavy um, but they use metallic parts they use instead of iron steel they they've been using aluminum mostly uh, and now there is a uh, interest in using composite materials uh, but metallic parts are there where they have never completely uh, uh, eliminated it uh, but you can see cargo ships uh, surgical equipment uh, refrigerators cars etc a lot of uh, things are there which use uh, iron and steel and just making iron and steel is itself a very fascinating thing uh, again it's an industry that's been there for a long time uh, steel industry has been around for a very long time um, and uh, therefore uh, maybe it looks very common place but you should visit one of those industries i mean it's really nice to see this hot uh, metal pouring out of some uh, uh, container uh, the furnaces and uh, you're looking at liquid metal uh, which is uh, you know well over 1000 degrees centigrade and you you would be quite far from it you can still feel that heat the heat will come towards you and you can feel it uh, and it's very interesting experience to uh, uh, you know have um, so making this iron making it uh, steel 
Um, see, I told you that two thirds of uh, the periodic table is all metal. Uh, but the thing with the metal is it typically reacts and therefore you don't uh, in nature you often don't get metal in metal form directly you cannot just dig a hole in the ground and get metal in metal form typically you won't you will get it as an oxide or some in an oxidized state it will be it will have some other material it has uh, reacted with so much of metallurgy in fact uh, has this as the first step the first step is to first remove the oxygen or oxide whatever has oxidized it remove it from that metal and bring it to its reduced state which is the pure metal. So that is how you get iron from iron oxide, you will get iron and uh, so that is the, and that is the material that we find useful to use. And that is why it took a long time for us to reach the iron age because we needed the temperatures to melt that thing to get the iron out of it. So uh, this is the uh, uh, iron oxide and uh, I mean from that you get iron and in fact much of metallurgy is this exact process of where you move from this oxidized state to the reduced state and then use it as in a product in the reduced state and then you do a lot of things to make sure that it remains in the reduced state. What do I mean by that? Because by nature it will again react with oxygen and try to go back to its oxidized state. So that is what we are familiar with when we talk of rust, rust and corrosion and so on. In all that what is happening is you took iron, you converted it, you know, you took iron oxide, you converted it to iron, made it into some kind of steel and then you used it uh, as a product, uh, maybe to make a gate for your house etc. And then slowly because rain has been falling on it and moisture is, is around, maybe you are near the coast, there is some salt in the air, all those things get in, the, get in the way and slowly it goes back to being iron oxide and that is the rust, slowly your gate begins to fall apart in front of you and then you have to go and make a new gate or cut off some piece of it and weld a fresh part uh, there. So um, at some core level, metallurgy is all about converting uh, an oxidized uh, material to a reduced material and then maintaining it in the in its reduced state. Okay, more modern uh, activities include things like this integrated uh, computational materials engineering. Uh, this is basically the use of computers. So even if you are interested in uh, you know computing and computational techniques, uh, you can learn a lot of computational techniques uh, under the umbrella of metallurgical and materials engineering. And this is used extensively in the industry, uh, metallurgical and materials engineering industry, as well as in research uh, uh, laboratories and settings, where uh, they use this to test new theories, new materials and alloy designs, uh, predict various kinds of behavior. Uh, and so you can optimize a lot of things before you actually make it. And, uh, and you can also look at, uh, you know, you see a new failure, you can try to understand what that failure is using some simulation. So this is a very nice uh, process uh, and uh, there is a lot of scope here. Uh, so you can uh, match your uh, you know, interest in some computational uh, activities with this uh, uh, possibility that you can use it in this field. There is this issue of surface engineering and uh, uh, that is very interesting because it relates to a comment that I made earlier that we tried to first take this metal oxide make a metal out of it, that is what the steel plant does, it takes uh, uh, metal and metal oxide and converts it to a metal and that metal is what we are using in the vehicle, we are using in the car and so on um, and we want to safeguard it, we do not want our car to uh, generate, you know, end up having corrosion holes and so on. So where does this corrosion start, it typically starts on the surface, so uh, therefore surface engineering is very important, uh, we want the surface to be good because that is the surface, that is the uh, region that interacts with the surrounding. The surface is not, it is not just from the perspective of corrosion, the surface could also be an aspect that is uh, important to us from the perspective of wear and tear uh, and so on because like I said even moving parts, what are, what are in contact with the moving parts? The outermost surface of one part is in contact with the outermost surface of the other part. So that is what surface engineering is about and uh, therefore. Uh, we want to um, uh, make sure that the surface is very hard and it does not uh, you know easily degrade. So for example in automobile uh, parts this is very important all those crankshafts that are there lot of the shafts that are there which, which uh, you know undergo a lot of movement uh, interaction with other parts and so on. It is very important for those uh, parts to have very hard surfaces uh, but the interior will not be hard interior can absorb a lot of energy but the exterior will be very hard that is the way it is uh, made. Okay. So this is surface engineering, uh, it is used in various places, yeah, there is some mention here for example for biomedical applications, uh, so that is also uh, uh, useful uh, because 
uh, again this would see uh, we s I, I said you know um, uh, from metallurgy we have gone into materials engineering so biomedical applications is a very interesting area where you make parts for the body so you know now that you know these days it is uh, not unusual for people to have knee transplants where their uh, original knee that they were born with uh, got worn out and they had to change it to um, you know, maybe a titanium implant and so on uh, and so uh, the uh, there there is going to be wear and tear you are going to use that knee that knee is again going to uh, take your weight and as you walk around it is going to bend it's going to you know you're going to keep flexing your knee and it is going to keep on rubbing and uh, so it has to that is wear and tear i mean that's the uh, i mean your own knee which was uh, you know god given uh, got worn out and then uh, uh, you now have to work with this uh, man-made uh, knee. So that's that's the place where surface engineering matters. So surface engineering actually uh, focuses exactly on this. They say, okay, you make a product, the product is ready. Now let me do something just to the surface, only to the surface, so that the utility of this product is greatly enhanced. Okay, so that is what they do. They aim at that surface, and that is the idea of the surface engineering. In all of uh, material science, uh, materials characterization is a, is a common underlying theme, uh, which means what I told you a little while earlier, you might want to look at uh, some part under the microscope uh, to see what you have made. And this needs a little understanding of uh, the material science. So it is not something that is, uh, you know, immediately evident to you. But uh, uh, if you actually get into this field, this is one of the starting points for all the research that goes on in material science and engineering. If you get into any metallurgical and materials engineering uh, university uh, anywhere in India or anywhere abroad, you will find that uh, they will have an extensive materials characterization facility, which simply means they have a lot of instruments which can tell you a lot of detail about a sample you put into the instrument. It can tell you anything. It can tell you the melting point of that, uh, accurately tell you the melting point of that material. It can tell you uh, how the atoms are arranged in that material, uh, what is the composition of that material, uh, if, you st if you heat that material at what temperature, what reaction is happening uh, in, in the, if you heat the material in the presence of air, at what temperature, what reaction is happening. If you heat the same material in the absence of air, if you only have nitrogen for example as an atmosphere, what reaction is happening at what uh, temperature. Uh, like this you have a wide range of uh, uh, information, uh, pieces of information that you can uh, obtain about your sample. What kind of bonding is there uh, between those atoms that are present in that sample uh, and so on. A lot of different uh, pieces of information you can get and you have a, several equipment which are dedicated for these activities. And there is a lot of science behind how that equipment works. It is not simply that you put a sample in and you get some data out. At some uh, you know, rudimentary level that is what it is. But for you as a metallurgist or a material scientist, you will know the, you will get to learn the science of how the technique works and uh, what you will get out of it in the process. And therefore, you will have a better idea of if I want to improve my material, what should I do? How does this result help me improve my material? Uh, give me directions on how to improve my material. So this is what materials characterization is about. Materials processing, uh, this is again, I, I think I sort of discussed in the various things that we spoke about. Uh, these are techniques used to manufacture components from metals and other materials. So we sort of focus mostly on metals, but you will see increasingly in today's world, we have a lot of composite materials. Composite materials usually have uh, polymers, uh, which are, you know, kind of like the plastics that we have uh, in the world. And then you have these, uh, you know, uh, reinforcements put into them. So that it is actually a mix of more than one material. Uh, and it is done in such a way that you get properties that you would not otherwise be able to get from either of those two materials independently. Because they are together, you are getting this additional bonus. You are getting the best property of one material and the best property of the other material. That is a composite material. And uh, many products are today uh, available which are based on composite materials. Your tennis rackets, your uh, shuttle rackets, uh, many, uh, uh, many of the uh, you know, sports goods are all based on composite materials. Uh, many aircraft parts are now made of composite materials. They were being made of aluminum for a very long time and now they are being made of composite materials. So in fact, if you are an aeroplane enthusiast, uh, you would have noticed that you know uh, the Boeing 747 uh, has been gradually uh, retired from the fleet of most international airlines and it is getting replaced by the Boeing 777 in the Boeing line of products. Airbus has its own replacement. They have Airbus A350, A360 and so on. 
and now they tried the A380 and that that was not successful for some other commercial aspects. But what is this replacement? What exactly are they doing? Why can't you still fly the Boeing 747 today? Well, basically the materials have changed and because the materials have changed, uh, the uh, newer planes are much lighter and they give you much higher fuel efficiency. And it all comes down to that. You know, when you buy your car or your two wheeler, you ask, you know, how many kilometers to the retailer you ask, right? It's the same thing. You buy an aeroplane also. If you're rich enough to buy an aeroplane, you will go to the shop and you'll ask that Boeing manufacturer, how many kilometers to the retailer is basically what you will ask. And that is again important because uh, the price of the ticket is based on how expensive it is to fly. Everybody wants the cheap ticket. And if you want a cheap ticket, it has to be cheap and economical to fly. And that is why this uh, thing matters. So this is materials processing. Ceramic, functional and biomedical materials. I already told you something about biomedical materials. It's all there in part of a body. Um, incidentally, what are we? Uh, are we metals? Are we, uh, you know, uh, semiconductors? What are we? Well, if you actually think about it, we are sort of composite materials. Uh, we are made of uh, polymers, mostly. Human beings are polymers. All our tissue is uh, hydrocarbon based, which is what a polymer is. And so we are polymers. So in, in some sense, our tissue uh, is, we are, we are not very different from the plastic sheet that you, you know, polythene bag, uh, which we are now, you know, trying to avoid. Um, so we are mostly polymers and we have bone structure. The bone gives us some shape. So you can see here two different materials. Polymer is the muscle, bone is the structure that gives us some shape. If you just had muscles and no bones, we would just collapse in, in a heap of uh, flesh on the floor and that would look terrible. Um, but uh, I mean, at least from our current perspective, uh, if you have the bones, it gives us some structure. So we are a composite structure. We are a composite structure. We have bones and we have, uh, uh, so they are two different materials giving us two different properties and together it forms us. So this is what it is. And uh, of course, ceramic materials you are aware of, uh, you know, the plates that you use uh, are more commonplace ceramics, but many times ceramics are used in biomedical applications. So you want an artificial tooth. These days it is uh, routinely available. You go to a dentist, if uh, especially older people where they have had problems with their teeth, they get replaced with artificial teeth. Those are zirconium oxide teeth and uh, those are ceramic materials. So this, uh, so this is very commonplace and uh, uh, at the same time very sophisticated. So we, I sort of uh, will conclude with just a few slides here, opportunities. So what are the opportunities in metallurgical and materials engineering? I just gave you an overview of the kinds of aspects of research and uh, you know areas that people work in. Uh, I didn't talk about nanomaterials, so that will be one of the last few slides that we will look at. Uh, opportunities are diverse. You could come to any of these uh, uh, institutes. This is just a uh, you know cross section of some institutes that I'm showing you here. All the IITs, all the uh, you know uh, uh, good institutes of engineering, invariably will have a good metallurgical and uh, materials engineering department. I must tell you, if you go to let's say you desire to do higher studies in uh, the United States or in Europe or some other country, you want to try some higher studies in any of these uh, nations. Uh, almost any university that has, uh, that is, you know, famous in any sense will more or less be guaranteed to have a metal metallurgical and materials engineering department or at least a materials engineering department. So uh, that is the level to which it is prevalent all across the world. If you look at government labs, you have all these labs, DRDO, CSIR labs, uh, atomic centers, uh, ISRO, they all use material scientists. So material scientists are all over the place. You go to industries, you will find a wide range of industries. I've just put some here, Tata, Mahindra, Murugappa Group, General Electric, General Motors, the new, you know, new companies that have come, SpaceX, which just sent some rocket, uh, uh, those just two, three days ago, they sent some rocket up and uh, uh, people docked with the space station. Tesla, which is also related to the SpaceX uh, company. Tesla is the co car company, uh, electric car company. Honda, Toyota, these are all companies that extensively use materials engineers. The core of their activity is material science and engineering. You buy a car, but the heart of the car is material science and engineering. Uh, Applied Materials is a company that works with semiconducting materials. So the kind of materials that are there in your mobile phone, they are all coming from companies such as Applied Materials. So these are all industries which use metallurgical and materials engineers. How come we don't hear about them? We don't hear about them because usually if a person from one of these companies is giving a press release. He, is, he or she is usually not the engineer from the company. You will see the management person come and give the press release. Uh, and that is why we don't often hear about them. In fact, all these companies will safely hide their engineers because their engineers are their most precious 
uh, you know uh, asset and they don't want to lose their engineers so they will hire, keep them with them very safely that is why you don't hear about them much so i started with this question have you eaten a metal yes you have eaten a metal many of you would have eaten a metal uh, even if you didn't realize uh, about it i gave you enough time to think about it i don't know if you got the answer if you ever ate a sweet uh, many of the sweets you will find will have an uh, silvery surface on top if it has been done correctly that is actually silver you actually have eaten silver as metal you have eaten it as uh, metal and it has gone into you uh, that is an indian tradition to put uh, this thin layer of uh, uh, silver on uh, uh, on the sweet uh, you have to be careful i mean uh, traditionally this has been the case but you can't just like that keep ingesting a lot of metal uh, it can cause other problems so you have to be a bit careful but yes many of us have eaten a metal and i will finish with just a couple of slides on nanotechnology this is the new area that people have gotten into in uh, materials engineering uh, which is simply about things in the small scale um, and that uh, why is it a issue at all well there's an aspect of size uh, you can see here uh, we are used to an elephant of a certain size and a deer of a certain size and in our mind that picture holds supposing i gave you the opposite version i gave you a situation that looks like this a deer this size and an elephant that is small is it possible is it possible is there some uh, issue with it and so on well it turns out uh, nature made them like this so we we need not uh, i mean that that's not what my question is but basically if you keep on if you take a deer and you keep on increasing its size proportionally what you'll find is that the deer will no longer the legs of the deer will no longer be able to support the weight of the deer and the deer will collapse this is because as you increase the size the weight of that creature that animal is going up as the cube of the size right because it is related to the volume but the area of the leg is only going up because its area is a cross sectional area is only going up as the square of the increase in size so if you uh, if you go up if you increase the size of a deer by a factor of 10 its weight will go up by a factor of 10 into 10 into 10 it will go up 1000 times but the surface area of that uh, not surface the cross sectional area of the leg will only go up by a factor of 100 10 into 10 so suddenly 1000 times the weight is being handled by only 100 times the area and at some point that uh, uh, ratio will no longer be able to uh, sustain uh, to be sustainable by that animal it will collapse so so there is an impact in size nanotechnology uses this in the opposite direction we go to smaller and smaller and smaller in sizes and what happens is many properties uh, of materials are coming from some uh, phenomena that is occurring at some size scale. Uh, so, uh, so I am just showing you four uh, blocks here where the external size of the block is the same. right? So, I, it's, you can think of it as a brick, a brick in your hand. So, the external size of the brick is the same, but I can make the brick as a single piece where all the atoms are in perfect order from left to right. That is what you see here or I can make it with several pieces which are here but they are large pieces that is what you see here and I can continue the process. So, this has got several several pieces here which are all much smaller and then I finally go to some extremely small scale, size scale. So, this is what nanotechnology is about it is not about necessarily changing the external dimension of a product it is changing what is happening internally. So, you break the pieces inside smaller and smaller and smaller and it turns out then suddenly the properties begin to change dramatically. So, with the same material you get properties that are dramatically different and this is the field of nanotechnology and uh, this is used extensively in today's uh, uh, science. Uh, in fact, any uh, not only will you find metallurgical and materials engineering in many universities all over the world, in almost all those universities almost all the scientists will be working on nanotechnology and that nanotechnology impacts again everything. It impacts uh, the latest advances in any technology that you and I use are often related to nanotechnology. So, I think this is what I had to share with you. We will uh, halt here and uh, um, I will just see if there are any questions and uh, answer those. Okay, so I'm just going to look for your questions and see what we have here. So I have a question here. I want to pursue a career in research, uh, and it's from Suman Puri Odisha. 
uh, and what should I choose particular area uh, what are the factors we should consider when deciding it what are emer emerging fields of research in material science etc I think these are the questions that I answered um, uh, like I said you know it's a wide range uh, if you had some fancy in a particular uh, type of product maybe uh, you should now look at what materials go into that product and maybe that may help you uh, move in some direction uh, generally semiconducting materials nano materials uh, and biomaterials and energy materials uh, associated with energy you know you know people are working uh, very hard to get uh, to be energy independent uh, you know even india wants to be energy independent and having the right kind of uh, technologies which make us independent of uh, foreign suppliers and also makes us environmentally safe uh, are technologies that are uh, much sought after uh, different types of batteries different types of fuel cells uh, solar energy and so on so that's a very again a very interesting uh, area of research that you can get into okay um, okay there is something on color vision uh, impairment uh, i'm sorry i don't have the correct answer for it um, there must be companies where you can actually uh, work even if you have a color vision impairment that may be a policy that uh, varies from company to company because some of them have restrictions because you are on a, uh, a particularly for vision impairment because you are on a shop floor there is equipment around and uh, your safety is important to them so from that perspective they have some uh, uh, issues um, okay technical questions how to avoid voids in composite material that's a very uh, this is coming from Akshay Dotri right yes um, well, uh, that is a kind of a technical question uh, uh, and uh, it, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you really have to look at the experimental process that is used in terms of how you pour the uh, polymer uh, and how much time you get it, give it to set, uh, what is the viscosity when you pour uh, and, uh, you know, what kind of temperature conditions you adopt. So, this I cannot give you a specific answer because it is uh, very broad the question that you asked, but that is the general uh, approach that you have to do. Um, okay, somebody wants uh, to know about solution thermodynamics and that it should be included in uh, thermodynamics. Yes, it is part of thermodynamics course in metallurgical engineering. Um, it really depends on how it has been taught in your college. Uh, but these days there are very good courses available on NPTEL. Uh, so certainly use your college courses, uh, your teachers will know you well they will be able to explain things uh, as per your requirements. Um, but if you want to augment a particular topic, uh, you want to see another perspective on that topic, uh, please feel free to use an NPTEL course and uh, you will be able to, uh, I think, uh, get that kind of uh, uh, you know, diversity in the knowledge and also that particular point that you are uh, missing out on, you may be able to learn it. Okay. Um, Okay, a question from Lalit As Aswani um, from Shulajpur, Madhya Pradesh. What does uh, future life for entrepreneurship in material science as India is becoming Atmanirbhar? What is the current scenario of industry in this field in India? Uh, so this is very important. I mean, self-sufficiency is very important uh, for uh, any industry in India and certainly for metallurgical and materials engineering, material science and so on. A um, lot of scope for entrepreneurship, it really depends on what you are trying to do. Um, so uh, today, you know, again, we spoke about uh, you know, materials characterization techniques. Uh, it is nice to have techniques uh, all around the country, which a lot of uh, uh, universities can use. Uh, I, in my view, it is actually a good, uh, uh, potentially a good uh, industry that somebody could open, uh, good services uh, kind of an industry. There are so many colleges uh, which are there in the metallurgical and materials engineering area. And they all have students who need uh, materials to be characterized for their projects. And uh, we would do a great service to uh, all the uh, colleges and their students. If we had a services based uh, company, uh, which says that, you know, okay, we have all these techniques available with us and we have so many locations around the country. And if you send your samples to us, uh, we would analyze and give you some, you know, um, reliable manner. So it seems like that's a good uh, company to have. Um, I mean, of course, you would have to do a proper business analysis on it, uh, but that's again, for example, a good place where you can look at it, um, data analysis and so on uh, for a lot of the uh, data that is generated 
uh, we can do uh, of course uh, new materials is always an uh, fascinating thing to work on uh, but generally that is a little bit more difficult to start off uh, a completely new company with uh, trying to come up with a new material if there's a new material you can build on it uh, certainly new batteries new uh, why should we import batteries why should we import such technology there are many researchers in, in india who are coming up with new uh, battery chemistries so uh, uh, starting companies which uh, make these batteries into commercial products would be great we could export it we could uh, you know uh, use uh, batteries which are based on materials that are available in india not depend on having to uh, uh, import raw materials from countries which are not which may not necessarily always be friendly to us we can see even in the current crisis there are countries you know which suddenly become aggressive uh, so we don't want to have any dependency on them uh, and uh, whatever resource they have we should we should exist in a state where we say we don't care what resource you have we have enough resources to do what we want so that is very nice um, Okay. Uh, there are questions on uh, uh, gate rank uh, metallurgy. I mean, I, I think that's a very specific question. Um, is gate exam mandatory to get a good job? No, of course not. Uh, it is just something that is relevant for higher studies under some circumstances so where it is relevant you use it uh, typically uh, uh, certain certain uh, 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 i mean certain uh, psus are using gate as a entry criteria so therefore there it is uh, useful for you uh, but what i'm saying is it is not mandatory for any job i mean so there are quite a few jobs where that is uh, not uh, mandatory um, okay We just see here. I think many of these questions I have answered. Uh, okay, I have a degree in power electronics. How can my knowledge in materials help me? Okay, even in electronics, um, I suspect uh, you have uh, you know new components that are made. Um, where let's say I mean even now they we work on things like uh, um, let's say uh, if you want to minimize eddy currents and so on, uh, you would like to look at uh, the uh, uh, materials that are used to see how you would go about doing that. Um, and so that's therefore I can see a very obvious place where you have power electronics, uh, uh, you know, interacting with uh, metallurgical and materials uh, engineering kind of uh, topics. Computational material science can I think there's a question from Anirudh uh, from Varangal. Can you elaborate? Uh, can you elaborate more about avenues in computational material science and its present scope in India? So there is a lot of avenues uh, for computational material science because, um, as I said, um, if you look at the periodic table, two thirds of the uh, elements are metals. Um, so clearly there is like infinite possibilities of what you can do with metals if i just take metals and I start mixing up them uh, mixing them up i have infinite possibilities where is the time and space to actually create infinite possibilities of all materials and then try them out and then uh, you know uh, figure out what you can do with them and so on even in, in a material system there are infinite possibilities even if you say one uh, uh, you know metal is going to be the predominant uh, uh, material and you're going to alloy it in different ways. But frankly, there are infinite possibilities. So computational material science is a very powerful technique if used carefully. You have to use it carefully and uh, very judiciously with a lot of knowledge because you have to understand that a computer, if you throw information into it, it will throw some result out. That doesn't mean that the result is meaningful because you may throw in the wrong information, you may ask it to do the wrong thing and then naturally it will give you the wrong answer. So you cannot just say, I used a computer so it is right. It doesn't work that way. You have to know a lot to use it correctly get that information from the computer and then uh, use it for some uh, purpose many companies uh, i mean uh, desire very good computational uh, material scientists because otherwise the possibilities seem you know uh, something that they cannot handle it just seems like such a wide world out there what can i do kind of thing 
uh, computational material scientists uh, help in a great way to cut down the possibilities. So they will do some careful experiments. They say, okay, do give me this data, give me that data, give me the other data. I will narrow it down somehow. And uh, using knowledge of material science, using knowledge of what are called phase diagrams, uh, which represent what are all the different uh, possibilities that the material can form as it, uh, as it exists. And uh, so th it is very useful in many, many industries and I think uh, great scope for it. Uh, I will also tell you that, you know, like with any field of engineering, um, in metallurgical and materials engineering, you are going to learn some skills. It is up to you to use those skills, up to you to sell those skills in you to a company that you are uh, desiring to work in. So it is not going to help if you simply say, I did a course in computational material science, please give me a job. They may not give you a job. You should do some homework before you go for that interview and see what are, what are the products that those people are working on. Uh, what kind of issues are they, uh, either they have said openly or you think from literature they may be facing. And so when you go to the interview, you should say, see, uh, uh, I, I know this technique and I think in your industry, these are the kinds of problems you face. In my opinion, th with the techniques that I have, after I learn a little bit about the processes that you are following, uh, I believe I can contribute like this to help you cut down the possibilities, to help you cut down the cost and, and in, uh, reduce the time that it takes for you to go from one generation of your product to the next generation of your product. So this uh, is what you have to bring with you to the interview. And I think that is true for I think many of the other questions also people have asked about career and so on. Uh, this ability that you bring this knowledge and you tell the, so you have to prepare for that interview, you have to go focus on what their products are, go prepared with respect to their products and say what, it, what do you think uh, you can contribute to it and that would make a very uh, big impression to them. Okay, um, Shashidhar Reddy has asked, is there any research going on on materials which absorb pollution causing gases um, in a way like sponge absorbs water? Yes, in fact, uh, there is this, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, uh, you know, people keep talking about this carbon dioxide in the air and how it contributes to global warming and so on. Uh, so there is this field of uh, material science where they work on something called carbon sequestration. Sequestration is simply this idea of capturing carbon dioxide. So they work on materials where you basically you pump air through it, it will preferentially uh, absorb carbon dioxide, it will preferentially absorb carbon dioxide, release air. You also have many water filtration uh, devices which are based primarily on the same technique. You have this uh, filter and water goes through that filter, as it goes through the filter, all these uh, impurities get preferentially absorbed by that filter. And it will have some capacity, it can handle maybe, I don't know, some 1000 liters of water and at that point you have to clean the filter in a certain way, put it back, it will handle another 1000 liters of water. So these are uh, definitely areas of research that exist in material science and certainly you can look at it. Okay, I believe those are the questions, there were a few more but I think uh, in the scope of what all I covered, I think I have covered most of these uh, in some way or the other, may not be exactly the question you asked but something related to the question. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope uh, you look forward to a career in metallurgical and materials engineering. I hope if you get an opportunity to be a metallurgist or a material scientist, uh, you can go in there with some confidence that uh, it's a nice area and uh, you can have uh, a very good future in it. Um, like uh, and uh, like I said, uh, as this is true with any field, uh, you have to get a good understanding of what your capabilities are, what is your talent and uh, so that when you go to a company, when you go to uh, a job interview, you project yourself correctly. If you simply say I have a degree and this is my degree, give me a job, uh, mostly that is not considered that impressive in companies. You have to really bring out what it is that you have learned. Uh, maybe in the subjects that you learned, you have some few things that you really like. You should say that. Uh, many times the interview will start with just that question. What uh, subject did you like in your uh, bachelor's degree? So you should be, so that, that question itself is not something that many of us are prepared for. You should have in your mind, let's say there are two or three topics that you really liked. Uh, and you should say these three topics I like. And then, then in that case, they will ask you a lot of detailed questions on those three topics. And then they may ask you some general questions about other things. So you should bring out your expertise. You should first of all understand your expertise and bring it out when you go for an interview. Uh, and uh, if you are in the field of metallurgical and materials engineering, especially such a wide field 
uh, as metallurgical materials engineering doing that homework will make you a very successful person okay so with that we will uh, close this session thank you for joining us this evening bye